All right, it's 11.15, time to get started. Um, there's just a few different updates that I'll go through to remind everyone. Uh, problem set five is due on Monday. This will be before class time. Again, so someone was asking to try to get this pushed back a little bit, but we really kind of need to have the day in order to grade things. Um, I'll try to be available on on uh, Sunday. Yeah, in, in a minute we can go over some problem set questions. That that's not a problem. Let me just get through some of these news and updates. And I wanted to address a Piazza thing first. Then we can we can go to that. Um, this will be on GradeScope. I need to still uh, post the problem set uh, assignment, but I'll I'll do that today. Um, I posted a practice exam five. So you can have something to look at to see the types of questions that will be there. Um, I posted a feedback quiz. You may have had some of these uh, for other classes that are similar. I would appreciate whether you have, um, you're happy with the arrangements. If you just want to reinforce that, that would be very much appreciated. Or if there's things that you would like to see changed, um, I'll do my best. I'll try to take into account uh, the different feedback. Uh, my goal is still to try to do um, what is best for the class overall globally, um, individual situations, I can try to manage the best I can um, on the side. Um, I think for the next exam and probably the final, we these will be an open book, open note format. There's been uh, some requests for this. I, I think it won't change the exam very much. I won't make it necessarily like way more difficult or anything like that. I think the time limit largely um, prevent it, it from being too much uh, help if you like don't study you're over relying. I think that would um, it would still require you to learn the material. Um, the only question that would probably be uh, less present is something like what type of functional group is that? As that would sort of probably be something that'd be a little bit um, too easy with that sort of format. Um, but I'm still going to make the decision, and I would um, maybe if there's something you could comment on the quiz, it would be something about that if you think this would be good or bad, what your feelings are. Um, lecture 30 I intend to have posted by this evening. That way you'll have uh, the day or the weekend to, or the night to the weekend to, to view it. Um, I think it'll be a slightly shorter lecture. The first two had a bit more information in them just so that we got through uh, the material that we needed. Um, so just to do a brief overview, since this is for technically lecture 29, um, these were about reactions of 1,4 unsaturated carbonyl compounds. So these, these end up being enones or enoates. And the main takeaway message here is that in, in addition to having electrophilic carbon at the carbonyl as we've usually been seeing, we also now have an electrophilic carbon in the four position where these are labeled one, two, three, and four. Um, so we have actually now selectivity issues in nucleophilic additions to these types of molecules. Um, there's a special case of how we can epoxidize these with hydrogen peroxide that we went through. And the general concept is, is it a hard nucleophile or a soft nucleophile? Hard nucleophiles have very concentrated uh, electron density. Usually they're highly reactive, and these will react in the 1-2 fashion. Whereas soft nucleophiles will tend to add in the 4 position. And these are things like cuprates, uh, enolates, which are of particular relevance to this section, and things like amines. We learned some more named reactions. These are more application of the earlier reactions we've seen or similar concepts of hard, soft nucleophiles. And we also learned how to make beta keto esters. Um, this involves the sort of dimerization or reaction of two esters together. The main takeaway here is that the intermediate that forms ends up getting deprotonated. And this is very stable. I need to erase this. This is very stable. It generally doesn't do any more reactions with carbonyl compounds um, like esters. So then it gets kind of trapped in this deprotonated form that takes it out of equilibrium. And then upon workup with acid of some sort, we will get the beta keto ester back out. So before I go through uh, a Piazza question, does anyone have any questions on formats or the updates or upcoming assignments at the moment? All right, cool. Then I will move on. So this is a question that was posted on Piazza uh, that I thought would be instructive for everyone to uh, kind of look at and, and see. Uh, the, and so this has to do with whenever we were 
uh, doing these beta keto ester syntheses, we would need to deprotonate this last hydrogen that's between, because we're under basic conditions, and the sodium ethoxide that was in solution would quickly deprotonate this hydrogen. And then workup just kind of brings it back to its original form. So in, in the uh, presentation, I had it protonate at this carbon center for, the, for whenever it was protonated. And the question is, why wouldn't it protonate at the oxygen? And so this is a pretty good question. Um, for normal ketones, we usually will protonate at carbon because of the keto enol tautomerization that can occur, where usually the ketone form is more stable. So we'll protonate at carbon just to get it to the more thermodynamically stable form. Um, even for simple enolates, you could potentially protonate at oxygen first. This absolutely could happen. And this would lead you to the enol form, but under the reaction conditions, it would still have this equilibrium that will strongly favor the keto form. Beta keto esters are actually a, uh, a bit more unusual case because when we look at carbonyl compounds and their you know, keto enol tautomerization, we said that this one is over 99%. For a diketone, the equilibrium now slightly favors the enol form. And we said this was, I think, a 76% to a 24%. So beta keto esters end up having actually more intermediate uh, equilibrium between the two. While we didn't go over this um, explicitly, and you're not expected to know these numbers by um, any, any stretch, these actually slightly will still form favor the keto form. They will have some of the enol form around, absolutely, but it's a little bit less because of the ester being more resistant to enolization. Esters have even less um, enol form than ketones because you would have to break up the resonance along the way. Um, for solutions, I would accept either one. This will be okay as an answer. This will be okay as an answer. Um, so at the end of the day, you can write either one. It's a good question because these will have more enol content than your average carbonyl compound. And you guys don't have enough information to know exactly where this equilibrium is. So for, if it were a ketone, definitely write the keto form. If it's an aldehyde, definitely write the aldehyde form unless there's some other considerations in place. And for beta diketones, you can pretty much write either one. For phenol, you should just write phenol as the equilibrium and not its keto form. All right, so if there's problem set questions, I can try to help you out here. Fire away. I go over starting the mechanism problem? Sure. Dun, dun, dun. So I did this in um, the office hour a bit, so I'm going to go kind of approach it the same way. So I think the, the thought process is, is good to sort of discuss and evaluate. So ignore this little fragment over here. So in this mixture, we have, this is a benzyl group. We can just say this is R. It does not play any significant role in the mechanism other than just a way to kind of track where substituents go. We have a methyl ester and we have sodium methoxide around. So we have a base here. And the, the problem itself, benzyl actually means 
um, this type of group, a carbon with a phenyl ring attached. Yeah. Um, I can start talking a little bit about 12 in a minute. We'll go through this one first. And so this one looks pretty strange, right? Because we have the ester that somehow ends up what looks to be on the complete other side of the ring, while we have this benzyl group just stay in the same place. Um, this, this question is um, visually, I think, a bit misleading on how the reaction will go. And so this is why it, I think it's good to try to first go and just look at the um, think about the mechanism and what can happen and usually the arrows will potentially take you in the right way. So what can sodium methoxide do with this molecule? We, we need to try to determine what are the different possible reactions and then we're going to try to decide if there's productive steps afterwards. But can someone suggest a possible reaction that could take place? Okay, so one thing is this methoxide could attack the carbonyl. This is a very reasonable consideration. Ketones are more electrophilic than esters. and it leads to ring opening. So I think some people may know how this problem goes. So before we continue down this path, because this will end up being the correct way to go, I still want to point out some other reaction pathways that you may consider that end up being non-productive. So I'm going to write these in orange, non and red, non-productive. So one thing you could try to have the methoxide do is deprotonate the carbonyl, because that is certainly something that can happen. And that would give us an equilibrium. This would give us an enolate. And this is probably in solution to some extent. It just can't really react with anything else. Trying to do an intermolecular attack on the ester um, would be pretty slow because it's so hindered. And it also doesn't get you towards the final product because you can't have a dimerization along the way. So this is going to be non-productive. Another attack you may consider is attacking the ester instead of the ketone. And this does lead you to a tetrahedral intermediate. But any way you collapse this tetrahedral intermediate, it just goes back to the starting material again. So this is also going to be a non-productive pathway. So we said this is going to, this, now we're going to look back over to the intermediate that I said will get us going in the right direction. And he said we want to ring open. So this is one of the, I think, less obvious reactions in this section. These are always kind of hard to see or pr predict because we're going to have a tetrahedral intermediate break a carbon-carbon bond. Um, the reason is we do have a decent leaving group on this carbon because the resulting anion would be stabilized by resonance, resonance as an enolate. This is going to be a generally favorable process because we have a very sterically congested intermediate that wants to break apart from each other. So this would have the arrows go down. We'll have, you could draw at first just the electrons on that carbon, but they would of course be in resonance with the enolate isomer. We can draw it out that way. So it's good to keep track of your carbon. So we're gonna have four methylenes and attached to the fourth methylene one, two, three, four. one, two, three, four. We're now going to have our enolate. Okay. 
We can always go back and double check, make sure we counted things correctly. This was one, two, three, four, five, and six. This was one, two, three, four, five, and six. So, so we look to be pretty good. Now what can we do? We have this new ester enolate. We have a mixture of sodium methoxide and methanol around. Yeah, so we got this ring opened problem. So something to keep in mind is, is actually this solvent right here. So we are in methanol. Um, so the, the numbering is usually just to, as a reference of whatever I can map onto the, the product. Um, I would say develop a system that works for you. Because I could clearly see that for the numbering that this carbon one came directly from this tetrahedral intermediate, so that's where I started. As long as you are consistent with your numbering, it shouldn't matter too much. Yeah, there, there's not a strict rule to this. So when we have these types of reactions and we're in sodium methoxide and methanol, the, all of these types of reactive species being in, in equilibrium is pretty important. So we always want to consider potential proton transfers. So from this um, ester enolate, the only electrophile that's around is actually this carbon one, and that would take us backwards a step. And we don't want to go backwards, we want to keep going forwards. So what we'd want to do is simply protonate this ester enolate. Because we do have methanol around, and this will be a favorable equilibrium. The ester enolate is a minor um, reactive component in solution. So we can now draw our molecule again. I'm just going to move it around a little bit. Hopefully set us up suggestively for what we need to do now. Let me draw my methyl ester a little bit better. So now we still have the same sort of reactive intermediates around. We have methanol and sodium methoxide. So who has a suggestion for what we could do next? Yeah, yeah, you just got to now form the enolate on the other side. Because we have to consider that both of these enolates will be in equilibrium. Protonating the one with the R group will take us backwards. This new one will lead us to a new enolate. And then from here, we now have our intramolecular cyclization to go forward. So we're going to make a new tetrahedral intermediate. An R group here. And at this stage, technically, this is reversible, right? It, it, in principle, could go either way. Methoxide will be a much better leaving group than the ester is. But all of these things, formally at this stage, are still in equilibrium.
and we make now the product of the mechanism. Oh, yeah, sorry. Talking and writing, sometimes I miss an arrow. So, so while this looks like the product, why doesn't this just go backwards? And so now we need to come up with a rationale for why does this go actually to this product and stay. Anyone have any ideas why that is? Yeah, so something to keep in mind, there is an irreversible step to form an enolate. So something that the starting material did not have was a very acidic hydrogen between the two carbonyls. We have two carbonyls here, and if a hydrogen existed here, it'd be very acidic because it has a lot of resonance stabilization. In the new product, we do have a hydrogen in between two carbonyls. It's a 1,3-dicarbonyl or a beta-keto ester. That means that the methoxide that is in solution will very quickly take this hydrogen away. And this has an equilibrium that strongly favors a very stable enolate. And because this is so stable, and because its equilibrium has been pushed here, this is the overall driving force for why it does switch around. Some other factors are that this would be a less sterically hindered product, so that would also be in its favor. But it's really being able to deprotonate it that gets it stuck in this sort of kinetic trap where it can't really get out. So this low energy state is the reason why we are able to make this go forward. And that's also why we need to have an aqueous workup afterwards. We need to have a good acid to come back and protonate this molecule afterwards. So it does seem a bit silly to go and deprotonate a molecule just to reprotonate it again on workup, but it explains why the reaction takes place and why we're able to get this problem. And this is really the, the core of all beta keto ester syntheses and why they're able to form. So this enolate is a bit too resonance stabilized. All the electrophiles that are in solutions are esters, and these stable enolates won't be able to attack another ester. This is a limitation of their reactivity. So you can have these beta-keto uh, ester enolates react with, say, a ketone or some alkyl halides, but they cannot react further with, with other esters that are around. That intermolecular reaction is just too slow and it's a sterically hindered uh, center as well. This would further discourage um, its reaction. So again, so we could, you can also have this, oops, I didn't mean to make a circle, as a resonance isomer where you put the oxygen on this carbon as well. Ketones have more uh, make sta more stable enolates. So usually you'll draw the electrons over to the ketone side rather than the ester side, because that allows it to maintain more of its resonance contribution. And you could also write this as an enol product if you wanted to. As I said at the beginning, um, I'm not too picky on beta carbonyls which one you choose, since both arguably will be in solution. Any other comments on this? Should we write out equilibrium arrows? Um, for a mechanism, equilibrium arrows are, are, I would say, preferred. I don't think we will count off, especially in, an, in a mechanism we're kind of talking about going in one direction. Um, if I ask you 
to ever describe a bit more about a reason why, then I probably would want to see an equilibrium arrow because that's sort of the core concept. Um, and, and that is a question on the practice test, but um, I won't have an explanation question on the, uh, on the actual exam, uh, both due to uh, ability to, to grade them more efficiently and um, And there's other things that I can ask that I think would be more effective. Something you could do if you wanted to, note that this was uh, going from something like this intermediate to this intermediate. This is technically just a proton transfer. I think a lot of times if you're trying to keep track of all the atoms when you're working on these problems, it's probably useful to draw out that intermediate along the way. But this would formally just be a proton transfer because we did a deprotonation, reprotonation. Well, any other questions on this? There's a question on Piazza. It's hard for me to bring the exact question in, so I'll try to summarize it. And this is asking about the haliform reaction. These are good questions. So one question about, so to remind everyone the haliform reaction, um, this is when we have some sort of methyl ketone. So the, the methyls on each one can be in, these can be in equilibrium with things like sodium hydroxide. to give you an enolate, and these are also done with bromine around. So bromine is able to attack, or the enolate is able to attack bromine. We make an alpha halo ketone. And this happens, this process happens two more times. And we can make tribromomethyl ketone. Now we have a situation where putting three bromines on a carbon makes it a very good leaving group. So this is able to attack, give the tetrahedral intermediate. Now the carbon tetrabromide gets kicked out. We end up making a carboxylic acid briefly, along with this carb anion that's really stabilized because we have three very electronegative substituents on it. Um, you can either say that it's going to be this anion that will deprotonate the carboxylic acid or additional hydroxide in solution. Either one is fine. And this gives you bromoform. That's the common name for these types of halogenated compounds. You may have heard of things like chloroform before. It's a fairly common solvent. And in movies, they used to use it to like um, knock people out or as an anesthetic. So the question, though, is what if we have a Similar case, only now we add another carbon to the ketone. So now we can't make a tribromomethyl group. And the, and the implication is, is this resulting dibromo compound still going to be a good enough leaving group to make a carboxylic acid? And the answer to that question is no. It stops here. You'll just do a dibromination or a monobromination, and it won't be able to fully hydrolyze to a carboxylic acid. And the, the second question along the way is, for this reaction, do we want to draw it as a carboxylate salt or a carboxylic acid? 
um, this this means this carboxylate. Um, I would accept either one as an answer. Um, if I listed explicitly, you know, an acidic workup, then probably we would want to have this go all the way to a carboxylic acid. If I were not to specify on an exam, I would accept either one. If I forget to list a workup step, I will not penalize you guys for drawing the non-protonated versions. But I would say pretty much in all cases, um, I'm expecting to see a, uh, a, a assumed workup. Okay, so we got a never mind. So here's a general question. For the addition of enolates to aldehyde and ketones, how do we know if we get the elimination product? Will it always kick out a leaving group or does it depend on the reaction conditions? So there's two general cases that we've seen. Um, one, it will depend on the reaction temperature. So if we're using sodium hydroxide as a base, okay, there's a few different conditions I can go through. So if you use sodium hydroxide as a base, and usually that means there's water around as well, these are under equilibrium conditions. So if you had, let's just say for example, this aldehyde, it could self-dimerize to give this aldehyde, and it could potentially further eliminate to give the, the final aldehyde afterwards. Um, if this is done cold, I would say, if I list something that is, you know, five degrees Celsius or less, I'll try not to have any ambiguous uh, room temperature cases. And in this case, um, the reaction conditions would be the same, only we're gonna see heat added to it. So if you see heat, assume that there will be a double bond formed, assuming there's something there to eliminate. If you see something cold, then assume we're going to be ending at the alcohol. Um, so cases with LDA, they're a, usually done very cold, so it'll follow the same, um, I, I think, consideration. There's also no free protons around to do a lot of the acid-base chemistry that get that does the E1CB elimination. So in the case of LDA, we are going to always get the alcohols out. I'm going to say after workup, we'll, we'll give the alcohol. So these are usually at minus 78 degrees Celsius, so very cold. And I think there's one other case we would want to consider, and this comes from the most recent topic on reactions of beta keto esters. When these react with something like an aldehyde, we're going to make the enolate. It's going to add to the aldehyde. It'll still have the same intermediate. But sodium hydroxide, pretty much at any temperature, will result in the elimination. And this is because the, the slow step actually going from here to here is the deprotonation. Um, and so these are so acidic, and they can exist in the enol form. There's too many pathways. And usually it adds to increased conjugation. So these are the ones that you really can't stop from happening. So it's the idea of two times electron withdrawing groups, always elimination. So, so if it's cold under either conditions, um, usually the elimination step just requires a bit more heat to get enough of the enolate populated to promote that reaction to take place. 
And it just so happens that doing these at low temperature versus high temperature, this is sort of the window for aldols to have that selectivity. The, the reality is this is much harder to control in real life than is presented in the book, but this gives us, but this is generally true, these rules, um, you usually can control the different additions. And so saying cold versus heated will give you the two different products. Um, and it just has to do with the rate of making enough of the enolate in solution to promote the elimination. In the case of the beta keto esters or diesters, this enolate is so favorable to form that it's, it has more than enough concentration to always eliminate under the reaction conditions. With LDA, we also, and, and so the final part is specifically in LDA, why we don't ever see elimination, is that there aren't any free protons around. So going from here to here, we end up needing to do a lot of proton transfers. Um, in the case of LDA, we have, we completely deprotonate this enolate. And then all, that means that after we add in the aldehyde, all of the alkoxide is fully deprotonated. There is no good way to shuttle protons around to get a protonated hydroxyl with an enolate next to it to affect the elimination. That clarifies things. Okay, so I'm going to make a little break. So there's a question on, in a reaction between an aldehyde and ketone, does H2O2 always cause the, a ring to form? Um, so I think you mean this situation? where we had a molecule like this, so you reacted a, uh, you did some sort of aldol condensation to make an alpha beta unsaturated carbonyl. If you react this with hydrogen peroxide and base to essentially make the hydrogen peroxide anion, you will always expect to make this epoxide. So this ring will always form if this is your question. Um, it's because this is a soft nucleophile, an attack on this double bond is going to be the fastest. And these reactions actually work really, really well. Here's a question. What about the second alpha hydrogen near the ketone? Um, so do you mean in the case of LDA, Sophia? So do you mean this proton? So we need to think about the reaction before workup, um, if, if this is what you're referring to. So the initial product of, of the attack um, is not going to be an alcohol. We're going to have this enolate. We're going to have this alkoxide. So are you talking about this hydrogen or this hydrogen? Let's say this is either A or B. Um, yeah, between the two. So this is a case where this hydrogen really is not very acidic at all, or it becomes less acidic than it normally would be because we have an O minus next to it. So you can make an electrostatic argument why another molecule couldn't deprotonate the hydrogen in between. Intramolecularly, the orbitals don't line up to do an intramolecular deprotonation. This is the wrong orbital geometry. That's why we always draw the proton transfers as being intramolecular, because many times the base that exists inside the molecule initially doesn't have the right geometry to actually deprotonate itself. Um, so we have this, so more or less this molecule just kind of gets stuck in this position until you end up adding uh, mild acid like ammonium chloride to work it up. So 
this is sort of our our endpoint. Whereas in the case up here, we're, on, we're in water, so there's going to be a lot of equilibrium of regenerating the original alcohol and back and forth in order to make the elimination take place. Um, well, with workup, we're going to have it under acidic conditions. So even ammonium chloride, something like this, this ends up being mildly acidic, and we wouldn't be making an alkoxide under, um, under acidic conditions, or especially not an enolate, which is even more basic and would be even more unfavorable. Usually the workups are designed to not eliminate these products. If you ended up working it up with like strong acid, like H2SO4 and heated it, then you could get that elimination to take place. I'm just checking Piazza. Any other questions? Let me explain why there wouldn't be an elimination product. Oh, problem 12. Yeah, sorry. I, just, I, will, I will. So if we had an addition product somehow where we had a hydroxy that's here, Let's say we, add, we somehow made this compound. In order to get this to leave, we need a, let's say, a carb anion. So usually whenever we go and we do have an alpha proton, we're able to make an enolate, which is kind of like a carb anion. And this being in a complete negative charge on this carbon allows this to eliminate. If these are methyl groups, then we can't make a negative charge here. And this hydrogen has way too high of a pKa. Just like you can't use something like sodium hydroxide to deprotonate a normal alkane. It's really the hydrogens that are next to carbonyls that have much lower pKa's that things like hydroxide can eliminate. And we have to form the enolate, or we could say this carb anion, a complete uh, deprotonated intermediate next to the alcohol to get it to leave as hydroxide. Sorry, I'm going to go check out number 12. I apologize. Okay, oops, wrong one. So there's two different elements to this problem. What? There we go. Okay, we don't know how to start it. So this requires actually um, recognizing a similar a similar reaction that we've seen in the notes or the lectures using this compound. Does anyone remember a special type of name reaction that uses this component to then somehow build on a whole other ring? I think this this the problem becomes much more straightforward after we make this connection. Yeah, there there is the Robinson annulation. And so in the notes, we have the reaction that is the Robinson annulation. You use methyl vinyl ketone. You can use sodium hydroxide and heat. Um, this first deprotonates the beta diketone and makes a stabilized enolate. This allows a tack on this enolate. So we'll do a Michael addition first. still have this other ketone. 
we end up doing a formal proton transfer to then make essentially the other enolate. This would be a two-step process. Which now gives us a way to use our electrons to come down and attack this carbonyl. Since we have heat around, this will make two different rings. I'm implying a proton transfer step there, and we're going to do the E1CB elimination. to give this intermediate. I lost my methyl. And so now your task is to go from this intermediate to here. So hopefully this helps you get started. And, and these would require some functional group transformations that we've learned from other topics. I think there might be one simplifying reaction that may or may not have been presented in the past. Yeah, exactly. So that, that's the general idea. Once, once, you, once you recognize this, then you want to be using some of the other reactions we have to introduce bromines, because we really only have one way to introduce a bromine, I think. I think that's the primary way we have to make alkyl bromides. Hmm. There are additions to double bonds as well, but given we have carbonyls there, we probably want to use that oxygen somehow to our advantage. There was a follow-up question because I mentioned someone suggested a possible solution, which I did say would work. Someone asked what would be shorter. Um, I, will, I will leave you guys to come up with suggestions that I will confirm or deny rather than um, giving you another answer to that problem at the moment. I've, I've suggested it, or I think it was mentioned in one of the previous either office hours or classes. That is an approach that I was thinking would be a little bit shorter. That, that is the answer that I think I have listed on the solution. So that is, that is an effective way to go. Um, I don't remember the exact, but that, that sounds about right. But it was the one that you asked about on Piazza. So I'm going to list this as resolved so Piazza doesn't have red things at me anymore. Yeah, that, that, that is the reaction, which I'm not sure if we really uh, saw in the past. But that would even further simplify problem number 12. It would save you a step. And that was introduced as sort of the different types of ways to make compounds using alcohol chemistry combined with reductions. I would, I would say that if on problem nine you find yourself making multiple products and an option is more than one is expected, then I think that is, that is reasonable. I didn't specify temperature there, but I think um, given the framing of the question, it, it should be pretty doable.
Um, I will erase this since this is essentially what we had, but I will mention um, I suppose if you went and just looked, then you would have a potential. So we went over this in one of the office hours. Um, I probably, I don't have time to go over all of it. I can go try to look up exactly when this was. This might, I think this was from office hours yesterday, so it should be on YouTube. Um, but this certainly uses the Aldol condensation combined with uh, another method from this section to get there. Um, I would be looking to, at least when if you're thinking about this from a big picker perspective, we want to try to map these different types of aldehydes on each other. Like where are these three carbon fragments? We can kind of break it down into these three. And then the aldol reaction is one of the reactions we have learned as a core component of the class. And that quickly gives you, gets you to most of the problem. So I'll let you go think about that and or review the other commentary on YouTube. I think you guys should be good to go. All right. Thank you for stopping by. Please let me know. I'll, I'll try to be as available as I can um, as you guys are completing the problem set to answer some more questions. Um, And if you can, fill out the little re response quiz on Canvas just so that I can try to make some adjustments for the next exam and final or uh, general presentation of the material if possible. Have a good one.